Take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke and find chapter 7 and verse 18. Luke chapter 7 and verse 18. Luke, the third gospel, the third book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Find chapter 7 and verse 18. We're going to be in Luke this Sunday morning and then next Sunday morning and then the next Sunday morning we're going to land on the 15th chapter of Luke. And you're probably familiar with three stories that Jesus told there in the 15th chapter of Luke. The third story is the most famous. It's called the parable of the prodigal son and we're going to I say land on Luke 15 because we're just going to land there for unless the Lord leads otherwise for about six weeks leading up to Easter and so we're going to be in Luke's gospel for a while so take your Bible and just kind of you know real good so it'll flop open to Luke for the next couple of Sundays let's pray Let's pray. You pray for me right now that I can deliver the message God's given me. And I tell you what, I'll pray for you. But you pray for yourself as well. And ask the Lord to speak to your heart this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come now and share your word. I pray it will be clear today, Father. I pray that nobody will miss the truth that you have for us and just what we can learn from looking at this one instance in the life of John the Baptist. I pray, Father, that, that you just speak through me and to us all today. And then I pray, Father, for those that have gathered in this place to hear. They, they didn't come to hear me, Father. They came to hear you. And, and, and I pray that nothing would distract them and that they would have a heart and a mind that's listening in tune to what you would have to say to them today, Father. I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by giving you, giving some of you, permission to leave right now. And here's who I want to just dismiss, okay? If you have never had doubts about your circumstances, what God was up to in your life, you may leave. If you have never wondered why some things happened to you and they happened when they happened, if you've never wondered why, you can leave. If you've never had questions about God's plan for your life, if you've never had questions about what He was up to in your life or why you found yourself in certain situations, if you've never dealt with any of those issues, you can leave. Okay. All right. All right. Just... Wanted to make sure who was in the room, okay? That's those of us that are left. Let's just be honest. And let's admit, I've doubted. I've had questions. I've wondered why. Me, a follower of Jesus Christ, have had a heaviness settle over my soul about the circumstances that I find myself in at times. Me, a follower of Jesus Christ, have let doubts drag me down. What causes doubts? What makes us question what God is up to in in our lives? What makes us want to look at heaven and sometimes even shake our fist and say, What in the world are you doing? What makes us think those things and act that way about the God we love? I've discovered there are three sources of doubt. There may be more, but... 
I've, I, I've, I've discovered that there are three sources of my doubt, three dilemmas that I struggle with that, that weigh me down at times. I've got them on the screen for you. The first one is, is that life's inequities offend us. It's just not fair. What happened? We experience hardships that lack any reason or any purpose that, that we can see. We may even experience outright calamity that defies explanation. And when we do, we tend to doubt God's purpose for our lives. And we ask, how can God be in control when everything in my life is out of control? Life's inequities offend us. The second cause of doubt, source of doubt, is that unanswered prayers confuse us. You pray, nothing happens. You pray harder, nothing happens. You pray for things that you even know to be the will of God, and nothing happens. God, do you hear me? God, do you care? You think things like that. And you say things like that. We all do. Listen to me. It doesn't make you any less spiritual because you do. The third source of doubt. Unfair treatment troubles us. Have you ever done what is right and suffered for it? You ever done what is right and things got worse? Where is God's justice in that? I thought God was fair. And so questions like this haunt us at times and you keep coming to church and you keep worshiping and you keep reading your Bible and you keep praying because that's what you know that you should do but, but what do you do? What should you do with all your questions? Be afraid of them so we just don't ask questions like that or we shove them out of our mind? No. Listen. It is... It is in the depths of doubt that you can discover God's richest lessons. Questions often lead us to a stronger faith. Our questions don't make us less spiritual. It's often our questions that grow us spiritually. Alfred Lord Tennyson once wrote, There lies more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. There lies more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. In other words, better to have questions which lead you to a deeper faith than just to blindly recite your beliefs. And if you read your Bible, you will discover that almost all of Scripture's heroes at one time or another went through periods of doubt went through times when they battled confusion and they questioned God. Abraham did it, Moses did it, Abraham did it. This morning I want us to look at the fact that even the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist, did it. And it is his doubt that I want us to look at this morning. It's his doubt that I believe we can learn some things from because it is in the depths of doubt that you can discover God's richest lessons. Now let me just refresh your memory. This is John the Baptist. This is John the one who the angels announced his birth. This is John, God's sharp arrow aimed right at the heart of a nation. This is John the prophet whose voice broke 400 years of silence. This is that John who found himself confused. Doubting. We begin in verse 18. Luke chapter 7, verse 18. The disciples of John 
reported all these things to him. Now, these things basically referred to the first 17 verses of chapter 7 of John. And in the first 17 verses of John chapter 7, you will find that a centurion's servant was healed. And you will find that a widow from Nain had her, had her son raised from the dead. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, that is Jesus, when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Go ask him. Are you the one... That, that was to come? Or shall we look for another? Could this be the same man who just a few months ago had boldly proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Somehow, some where John's exclamation point at the end of that sentence had curled into a question mark. Are you the one who is to come? John is doubting. He's confused. What's the source? Let's remember the context. Let's remember John's situation. John's in jail. John's in prison. King Herod has thrown John into prison for speaking the truth. And all of these wonderful stories about Jesus have found their way into this prison where John is. All power is at Jesus' disposal, John's disciples were telling him. Then why is Jesus allowing his faithful follower to lie in prison? Why can't Jesus do something to open the prison doors and get me out of here? I imagine John cried out to God over and over again to get him out of that prison. And yet nothing happened. And days grew into weeks, and weeks grew into months, and still no help came. And all of that was inexplicable to John. And his doubts grew larger and larger as the days went by. Remember the three sources of doubt? Life's inequities, unanswered prayer, unfair treatment. John experienced all three. Max Lucado writes these words. John had never known doubt. Hunger, yes. Loneliness, often. But doubt, never. Only raw conviction, ruthless pronouncements, and rugged truth. Such was John the Baptist. Conviction as fierce as the desert sun until now. Now the sun is blocked. Now his courage wanes. Now the clouds come. And now as he faces death, he doesn't raise a fist of victory. He raises only a question. His final act is not a proclamation of courage, but a confession of confusion. Find out if Jesus is the Son of God or not. The forerunner of the Messiah is afraid. Find out if I've told the truth. Find out if I've sent people to the right Messiah. Find out if I've been right or I've been duped. 
Notice Jesus' response to John's struggle with doubt. Jesus doesn't lecture. Jesus doesn't rebuke. Look at verse 21. In that hour, He healed many of people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, He bestows sight. And He answered them, you Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus tells John's disciples, Jesus tells those messengers, you be John's eyes and ears. You tell them what you have seen the Messiah do. That the blind do receive sight, and the lame do walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Why would Jesus tell them to do that? Because. Because remembering how God has acted in the past, helps relieve your doubt. And seeing God at work now helps relieve your doubt. And knowing that God is still at work helps relieve your doubt. It is in the depths of doubt that you can discover God's richest Lessons. Now look at verse 23. Jesus adds a beatitude just for John's sake. No, I think it's for our sake as well. Look at verse 23. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Literally, it is blessed is the one who is not trapped in regard to me. The word offended or trapped is the Greek word scandalizo. We get our word scandal from it. It's the Greek word scandalizo. And here's what it means. The word picture is a stick with bait on it. And when you go for the bait, you spring a trap and you are caught. A stick with bait on it. And when you go for the bait, you spring a trap and you are caught. So what Jesus is saying here is, blessed is the one who is not trapped or caught or does not stumble over my actions. Blessed is the one who is not trapped, who is not tripped up by my actions in his life. In other words, blessed is the one who does not lose confidence, is tripped up over what's going on in his life. Did you hear that? Blessed is the one who does not get tripped up or lose confidence in Jesus because of what's going on. In his life. Blessed is the one who never loses faith in Jesus. Over what's happening in her life. Let's make it personal. Blessed is the one who never loses faith in Jesus. Over what's happening in my life. In your life. Let me say it this way. Blessed are the Job's who suffer and yet stay faithful. Blessed are the Joseph's who are mistreated by their family, endure that unjust treatment and yet refuse to live in bitterness and even forgive them. Blessed are the Hoseas who continue to walk in obedience even though their spouses leave them. Blessed are the Pauls who pray for a relief from a thorn in the flesh and learn my grace is sufficient 
for you. In other words, blessed are all the Bills and the Toms and the Marys and the Sues and everybody else in here today, if I could call your name. Blessed are all those who suffer yet stay faithful, who endure mistreatment yet refuse to get bitter, who continue to walk with Jesus even though their mate has walked out, who pray for relief and learn that grace is sufficient. It is in the depths of doubt that you can discover God's richest lessons. Blessed are all those who can live with unanswered questions, who can rest in what they see, and who can wait patiently for God to reveal what they can't. See. Now, I want to read the rest of the scene because it completes our point of application. We have talked about it, it is in the depths of doubt that you can discover God's richest lessons. There's one more sentence we need to add, and it'll give you something to do. So let's pick up in verse 24. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A a reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet... This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is none greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of John of God is greater than he. Jesus rushes to John's defense. In front of the crowd, while, while other people might rebuke you for your doubts, while other people might condemn you for your doubts, while other people might look at you and say, what is the matter with you? Why do you think things like that? You need to straighten up. You need to act right. You need to quit being so unspiritual. While other people may rebuke you and condemn you for your doubts, Jesus will not. Never. He comes to John's defense and he says... This, is, this man is no reed blown about by the winds of popular opinion. This man is no pampered prince. This man is a prophet. Yea, he is even more than a prophet. And then look at verse 29. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by Him. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? This is Jesus talking. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him. He is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, here's our completed point of application. It is in the depths of doubt that you can discover God's richest lessons. Determined to be a seeker, not a scoffer. And this is how I want to close this morning. Look, look at what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and the lawyers or the, or the teachers of the law. These same Pharisees, here's what they have done. They have rejected John and now they are pushing aside Jesus as well. In other words, they are scoffing at both. They've scoffed at John the Baptist and his message and they are scoffing at Jesus and his message. They are impossible to please. And Jesus says that they are like whining children. You know what that's like? (laughs) Some of you know what that's like. They are like whining children who can't make up their mind which game they want to play. We've played the flute for you and you did not dance. We played the dirge and you did not weep. 
They, they can't make up their mind which game they want to play. They can't decide whether they want to play dance party or funeral home. I mean, they, just, they can't decide which one they want to play. And he, Here's Jesus' meaning. John the Baptist was austere. John the Baptist was stern. John the Baptist didn't mix well socially. John the Baptist didn't fit in. And you scoffed at his message and said, He has a demon. Jesus said, I've come a social creature. Jesus came a social creature. Weddings and parties. Man, Jesus was there eating and enjoying himself. And they scoffed at his message too. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. He has too much fun with the sinners. They scoffed. At both, there's a difference, and this is what I want you to see. There's a difference between seekers like John and scoffers like the Pharisees. Both may ask the same hard questions. God's not fair. Why is this happening now? Look, He's not answering my prayers. Both may ask the same hard questions, but scoffers close their minds to the answers. Nothing will satisfy them. Determined to be a seeker, not a scoffer. Yes, your doubts may disturb you, but don't allow them to destroy your fellowship with, with Jesus. Blessed, remember, blessed are those, remember, blessed are those who don't get tripped up over what I'm doing in their life. Blessings rest on those who can live with earthly inequities knowing that there are heavenly purposes. Blessed. So determined to be a seeker, not a scoffer. Bring your questions to God. Bring your inequities to God. Bring your unfair treatment to God. Bring your request to God and seek Him with all your heart. He can handle any question you have. He is a big God. He can handle your doubt. He can handle your frustration. He can handle your anger. He can handle your confusion. You bring it all to Him. Because you've determined to be a seeker, not a scoffer. Let's bow our heads together. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And I'm going to open up this altar this morning for all seekers that are here. And I just want you to come to this altar with your questions. I want you to come to this altar with your inequities. I want you to come to this altar with your unfair treatment. I want you to come with your request. And I want you to pour your heart out to God because He's a big God. He can handle it all. Seek Him. Seek Him. And then I'm talking to some of you that have never entered into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And today the Spirit of God is tugging at your heart. Today the Spirit of God is just drawing you unto the Father. I don't want you to come to the altar today, sir, or ma'am, or teenager. I want you to come to me. I'm right here at the front. And I want you to say what's true in your heart that you've come to give your life to Christ. You don't have to understand it all. I'll help you understand what that means. All you need to know this morning is that you need Jesus in your life. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take this time, these next few moments as we sing and do your work in every heart that's here. And that, Father, that uh, those that came this morning confused and some of them angry, Father, because of life's inequities, because of unfair treatment, because of their unanswered prayers. 
I just pray, Father, that they'll pour their heart out to you this morning at this altar. And find relief. Find answers. Pray for those, Father, who are lost and need to be saved today. Bring them down the aisle. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.